Hi, everybody. This is Arkady Frechtman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial attorney, and today we are talking about damages. Damages are how much your case is worth. They ultimately discuss value and what a case could settle for or what a jury may allow for after a trial and how much is the case worth how much you are going to get. And there was actually an annual update as to the law on damages here in New York just recently, this week, and I took some of the principles and I wanted to share it with you, some of the things that I learned. So it started off with general principles, and there were a few general principles on the law that were updated in uh, 2024. And so, one of the general principles was the fact that a jury's determination with respect to past and future pain and suffering will not be set aside by either the trial judge or any appellate court unless the amount the jury gives in their verdict, sometimes referred to as the award, right? What they, what verdict they, what amount they give to the plaintiff. If that amount deviates materially from what would be reasonable compensation, then the court could uh, change it. Either if it's too low, they could raise it, or if it's too high, they could lower it. So that's, but otherwise, the rule is to listen to the jury because after all, they've heard all the evidence. Both sides have prepared the case sometimes for years and years, like we've done other videos where you've seen a case, for example, uh, started in like 2018 and it only went to trial in 2023. So that's like, you know, that's a long time. That's like, um, you know, five, five years. Sometimes it's more than five years. So both the plaintiff's attorney, the defense attorney are preparing the case. They know the case. They know all the ins and outs. And now the jury is hearing all the evidence. And sometimes the trial takes like two weeks or three weeks or, or longer than that. So you don't want to deviate materially from what would be reasonable compensation. But if the amount does, you know, deviate materially from what's reasonable, then uh, it could be changed. But otherwise, the jury's determination will not be set aside. And, you know, there's case law on that. And prior damage awards in other cases with similar injuries are not binding upon the courts, but they only serve to guide and enlighten the courts in determining whether a verdict is reasonable compensation or not, right? Because how do you know what's reasonable? Well, let's say like you broke your, your finger, right? And you see, well, other cases that are with a broken finger, they go for 20,000. So if you got 20 million, they would say, wait a minute, this is not reasonable, right? You have to use the other cases as a guide and to enlighten you as to what's been sustainable. And there's, there's case law on that. But they also say that consideration should be given to other factors, including the nature of the injury and the extent of the injury. And a jury verdict on the issue of damages may be set aside as against the weight of the evidence only if the evidence on that issue is so strong that it's so in favor of the plaintiff that the jury could not have reached its decision on any fair interpretation of the evidence. So, for example, if a jury gives a verdict on the issue of damages and says, oh, here's, you know, $10 million. It could only be set aside if it's against the weight of the evidence. If the evidence is on that issue is so, they use the word preponderated, I guess, so in favor of one side, right? The plaintiff, that the jury could not have reached this conclusion or this determination on any fair interpretation. Like, you know, here's the evidence here are, are the fair interpretations. Okay, if you say it's worth this, that's fine. If you say it's worth that, that's fine. Some sort of range. But if you say, you know, what, what you decided, it's just completely, there's nothing in this evidence that could lead to that conclusion. It's just not rational. Uh, so that's the only time when a court can overturn a jury verdict. 
And they say, although the amount of damages to be awarded for personal injuries is primarily a question for the jury, a jury's award may be set aside if it deviates materially from what would be reasonable compensation. And there's a CPLR, a Civil Practice Law and, and Rules uh, section on that. And there's also uh, cases that are cited, precedents. So the reasonableness of compensation must be measured against relevant precedent of comparable cases. And a court's determination of the reasonableness of a pain and suffering amount is based upon an examination of comparable cases and such factors as the nature, the extent, the permanency of the injuries, the extent of past, present, and future pain, and the long-term effects of the injury. So that's why it's so important, you know, to do a deep dive and to really get to know the client, to understand how this injury has affected their life, how it's a life-changing forever injury, to go to their house, to interview witnesses, friends, family, to really be able to paint that full picture of the nature of the injury, the extent of the injury, and the future and the long-term effects and how has their entire life changed. Because if you don't do that, then the verdict could be a lot lower and, um, and see even the courts look to that as well. And if a defendant is going to be challenging a jury's verdict as excessive, they have to present lower amounts for comparable injuries that appellate courts have sustained, despite an appeal to increase the award because the jury's amount was unreasonably high. So that's what they have to, to do, basically. If they're going to challenge it, they have to show that um, if, if they think this amount is excessive, for example, there's a case and they say oh, 10 million, they say 10 million, are you crazy? That's so much. Well, they have to show lower awards for similar injuries, like say this an arthroscopic shoulder surgery, right? So same injury and the appellate courts have sustained those lower amounts um, despite an appeal to increase the uh, amount. Um, so yeah, that's basically the case law. And there's a lot of cases that, that cite to that, uh, going back to 2009, 2017, even going back to 2003 and different departments, including the first and the second department. So that's like the general principles that they talk about. And then maybe we could do, um, one or two cases. They also do a few, uh, cases where they talk about cases and then they, uh, discuss the result of cases. Here's one case. I think we might have actually done this case before, um, or maybe not. I don't know. I, don't know. I, th I think I did a similar case. But anyway, this is a case where um, there was a medical malpractice case, and it was a failure to properly diagnose and treat a stroke that led to a catastrophic brain injury. And it said that at trial, the jury compensated the injured plaintiff $51 million. It was $9.3 million for past pain and suffering, $41 million for future, and they gave 33.3 .3 years for pain and suffering. And it actually, the jury then compensated the spouse an additional $51 million, 9.3 and 41.6, the same, for the loss of services and society along with 550,000 for past medical expenses and household services. And the jury also compensated the plaintiff for anticipated future medical costs in the sum of roughly 18 million. Yeah, I think we did do this case. We, we did a deeper dive into this case. But while the jury was deliberating, the plaintiffs and the defendants, which was the hospital, entered into a high-low agreement. So the way that works is, you know, there's, a, there's basically parameters. So there's a low, so if the jury comes back with zero, you still get the low. And then there's a high. So if the jury comes back with like a billion dollars, well, you still get whatever the high is. So it's basically the uh, there's a low and there's a high. And if you get anything within, you know, between the low and the high, well, then you get that number. But if it's outside the range, then that seeks to, um, you know, provide you with a low so you don't get zero and also provide you with a high so that it's kind of like contractual, kind of like a, like a type of settlement, like a like a parameter settlement so that you don't get some crazy astronomical number that, you know, you might want that number, but they're never going to pay that anyway. They're going to appeal and it's going to take another five years. So is this high-low agreement. So basically they said that the high-low was 10 million was the low and 30 million was the high. 
And so they go into this case. They talk about the facts. I won't talk about the facts of this case because we. I think I think we did another video about this. So I could maybe link the video here and you could watch that other video where we talk about the facts of what happened and all the details. But essentially it was a stroke and it was misinterpreted. And because of that, it led to a really serious brain injury, a real, real life changing injury where the person uh, spends his days mostly sleeping, eating, watching television. Um, and they're fully aware that they have a brain injury, but they can't do anything that they used to do. Frustrated, sometimes they even become destructive and uh, has young children who are now afraid of him. And so, um, yeah, so that's basically the case. I guess they, they, they cite to this case. And let me see what other cases they talk about. They basically have different cases and they talk about the outcomes to see like what outcomes have been sustained. Here's a case with an auto crash, a car crash, with head and neck and back injuries. And this was um, a case where a plaintiff sustained injuries to the neck, to the cervical area of the spine, when a vehicle she was in was struck by a bus. So the jury found the plaintiff had sustained a serious injury, because that's the first question, right? You have to have a serious injury in any car accident in New York under the no-fault law, that's 5102D. It compensated the plaintiff $634,000 for past pain and suffering, and $111,000 for future pain and suffering for a period of 10 years. The second department found that the amount for past pain and suffering deviated materially from what is reasonable and ordered a new trial unless the plaintiff stipulated to a reduction to 300,000. So they basically cut $300,000 off the past. And I guess the future wasn't contested. And the plaintiff was 20 years old when the car that she was in was struck by a municipal bus in a parking lot causing her to suffer cervical spine bulging discs with radiculopathy that she testified left her in constant pain with diminished range of motion. She presented evidence that she sustained a loss of range of motion in the neck and underwent various treatments, including injections in her neck. These treatments alleviated but did not eliminate her pain and did not fully restore her range of motion. And her doctor testified that the injuries were permanent and her prognosis for a full recovery was poor. So yeah, so it's just an injection case. So that's actually a good number. I mean, the, the, the number they got was a good number, 634 plus 111. So you're talking about 740,000 just for some injections, which is excellent. But they felt they felt like that was too high. So they made it like 400, 300 and 100. So still something, but um, they cut it, they cut it down. Here's another case. This is a municipal claim with a motorcycle crash. And what happened, this was upstate. This was uh, upstate New York in the third department. And what they, the facts here, let me do the facts first so you could see the facts. Uh, I think that's better. I don't know why they do the facts second. I think it's better to do the facts first so you could know what's happening and then you see the results. It makes more, it makes more sense. Anyway, this was a plaintiff who was riding a motorcycle in that county in the town of Columbus, somewhere upstate, when he lost control, was thrown off and sustained serious injuries. He sued the county, alleging that the roadway was in disrepair and it had divots, potholes and dips that made it unsafe and caused his accident. And the county claimed that the roadway was safe and that the accident plaintiffs was his fault because he was convicted of driving while intoxicated and was driving too fast. So um, he was criminally convicted of driving while intoxicated at the time of the crash. His lawyers failed to raise the affirmative defense of collateral estoppel and proof of the convention was admitted at trial over his lawyer's objections. But they had multiple eyewitnesses that the plaintiff was not exhibiting any signs of intoxication when leaving the racetrack and that he was not operating the motorcycle in an unsafe manner. And the jury was also presented with evidence that the road was in severe disrepair and eyewitnesses observed that plaintiff only lost control when he encountered the divots and dips in the road, causing him to be launched off his motorcycle. And the defendant's workers, their employees, admitted that they were aware of the road's disrepair in the years before the accident, but took no steps to repair this uh, condition. And under the unu highly unusual circumstances of this case, a fair interpretation of the evidence presented 
could allow the jury to determine that defendant's negligence in failing to maintain the road was the sole proximate cause of plaintiff's injury. So even though he was drunk, you know, didn't really, maybe he was a little drunk, I don't know, he was, he was, he was just driving, but it was the, 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 the holes that caused everything. So when a judgment is made against the city, the interest rate imposed is a matter left to the discretion of the trial court so long as it does not exceed 9%. Now, when it is against private defendants, it can be 9%. To rebut the presumptively reasonable statutory interest, a city has to bear the burden of offering substantial evidence that the rates of return on both public and private investments during the period are below 9%. And if such statutory maximum is rebutted, the burden shifts to the plaintiff to offer evidence tending to show that a higher rate up to the statutory maximum is reasonable. Here, the third department found defendant failed to establish by substantial evidence that the interest rate lower than 9% was reasonable despite proffering expert proof from an economist as part of its motion papers. So the outcome of this case was that at the jury trial, the plaintiff was compensated by the jury $1,050,000, $250,000 for the past nine years and $800,000 for the future, 40 years for pain and suffering and $83,238 for medical expenses passed only and $40,000 for lost wages passed only. The jury also found that although the plaintiff was negligent for consuming alcohol before getting on his motorcycle, the sole proximate cause of the crash was the municipality's failure to properly maintain the road. And so the third department upheld the jury's determination of damages and causation. This is the appellate court now. And nearly a year after the verdict, the trial court, upon motion of the defendant, set the interest rate on the judgment at 0.31%, so almost like no interest. But the third department reversed and ordered a trial court to impose a statutory rate of 9%. So they're going to get the 1050000 plus 9% on top of that. So that's actually an interesting case. That's a very plaintiff-friendly case because, you know, a lot of attorneys won't take a case like that because they'll say, look, I mean, the guy's drunk. <laughs> he's DWI. He's convicted. He's arrested. He pled guilty to it. I mean, how are you going to prove that it wasn't him being drunk on a motorcycle? First, first of all, a lot of jurors don't like motorcycles, and this is way upstate. So this was a really good job, I think, by the plaintiff's attorney, first of all, to not pick jurors in voir dire that would be biased against motorcyclists or, you know, sometimes people are biased against bicyclists. That's already an uphill battle. Plus, the guy's drunk. I mean, he's not just drunk, but he's like, you know, a, you know could admits that he, he's convicted because he pled guilty. So that's pretty tough, but they still had so much evidence. See, that, that shows in order to win a case like this, that's what you have to do. You have to really dig deep. Like they, they did depositions. They found that the city knew about these divots and these holes that they didn't fix them despite knowing about them. So that gets the jury mad. Like, wait a minute, if you knew about them and you, why didn't you fix them? And, you know, they have all this proof and they have eye eyewitnesses, you know, because unless you go to the scene and you start interviewing people right away, how are you going to get eyewitnesses to a motorcycle crash, right? A guy hits a hole, flies off a motorcycle, you know, but if you have eyewitnesses, you have to go to the scene right away, do a full investigation, hire uh, investigators, take their statements, then do their depositions. It's a lot of work, but you see it paid off in this case. So good job. Kudos to the, to the law. I don't even know who it is. I have to look it up, but because I only have the notes from the um, the damages CLE. I don't have the actual, uh, but I could look it up and maybe do another video about that or or do a follow-up. I'm just interested myself. I probably don't know them because it's way upstate, but um, good, they did a good job. Okay, let's do one or two more cases and then we could do the rest later. I think these cases are all bunched together and they're all car crash cases. And then it gets into construction next. So maybe we could do the car crash cases and see if we have time to do the construction, like one construction case, and I could do the rest in another video. Okay, so the, the, the auto crash case, the facts were that a law enforcement officer drove his vehicle into the other lane of traffic and collided head on with a car driven by the plaintiff. So the plaintiff sues this uh, law enforcement uh, officer. And I think she sues him as an individual. It doesn't say that she's suing the city. So I guess maybe he was off duty. But anyway, um, after a bench trial, so there's no jury, this is a judge on damages, the plaintiff was compensated $832,000 for pain and suffering, $400,000 past for three and a half years, and $432,000 future for 36 years for various serious injuries, including a rotator cuff 
and labral tear in the shoulder requiring arthroscopic surgery, chronic shoulder pain, limited range of motion in the shoulder, bulging discs, and strains with chronic neck and back pain and limited ranges of cervical and back motion, as well as post-traumatic stress. So that's the amount that they, um, you know, gave, and I think it was it was upheld. And that was also in the third department upstate. Now here's a case with an auto crash with an arbitration, and this is in the second department, which is more like Brooklyn Queens. Uh, so what happened? What happened here was that the plaintiff sued to enforce a settlement agreement to recover damages for personal injuries and wrongful death in a motor vehicle accident where the defendant's decedent who was driving a motor vehicle insured by the plaintiff was injured and later died from his injuries. Defendant filed a demand for arbitration of an under insurance claim against the plaintiff and an arbitration award was issued in her favor for $950,000. The plaintiff alleged that the settlement agreement was negotiated and finalized by the parties on or about November of 2019, rendering the arbitration award a nullity. The plaintiff moved to enforce the settlement agreement and the defendant cross moved pursuant to CPLR 7510 to confirm the arbitration award. So the second department held that the purported agreement was not binding it explained that CPLR 2104 provides in relevant part that an agreement between parties or their attorneys relating to any matter in an action other than one made between counsel in open court is not binding upon a, a party unless it is in a writing subscribed by him or her or his or her attorney or reduced to the form of order and entered. To be enforceable, a settlement agreement must set forth all material terms and there must be a clear mutual accord between the parties. An email that merely confirms a purported settlement is not necessarily sufficient to bring the purported settlement into the scope of CPLR 2104. So you need a writing, you know, basically like a release or a writing, you know, that both parties agree. You can't just have like, you know, an oral settlement, oh, we settled this case for a million bucks, or oh, here's an email, you know, from one side, that's not enough. So I guess they, they confirmed the arbitration award in this case. Okay, now let's do maybe like one labor law case. And I guess that's that's good for today. We don't want to go too long. But this labor law is actually an interesting case because this is a labor law case, but it involves complex regional pain syndrome. So what happened in this case, this was out of the first department. The facts were that the plaintiff fell from a ladder at a construction site. He sued under the labor law and was granted summary judgment. At trial on damages only, the jury found he suffered severe injuries to his wrist and shoulder, as well as CRPS, which is complex regional pain syndrome. And we've done you know, other videos about that, including a trial I did on, on, that, on that, this injury. So four of his doctors, the plaintiff's doctors, and four defense experts found no evidence of CRPS and explained their findings based on the medical history and their respective examinations. The two witnesses that did testify that the plaintiff had CRPS were his physiatrist, whose evaluations were inconsistent with his own opinion, and a doctor who admitted to belatedly inserting a CRPS diagnosis in an undated addendum after a conversation with an unidentified person, maybe somebody working for the plaintiff's attorney, I don't know. So that's basically what, uh, what the facts were. And so the outcome was that the first department upheld the trial court's decision to grant the, to grant defendant's motion to set aside a jury verdict, which awarded the plaintiff one million for past pain and suffering, two million for future pain and suffering, and two point five million for future medical expenses, and directed a new trial unless the plaintiff stipulated to reduce the award for past pain and suffering to two hundred and fifty thousand future pain and suffering to 450,000, and future medical expenses to 10,000, unanimously affirmed without costs because plaintiff had not properly proven he suffered from CRPS. So yeah, you can't have that, I guess. I, I don't know the details, I'd have to read the trial transcripts, but this one doctor, who actually I know him, I don't wanna say his name, but I know this doctor, he's been around a long time, 
he's one of these doctors that just testifies a lot. You know, there are some doctors that testify a lot for both, you know, mostly for defendants because they're the IME doctors, but some doctors are known kind of like, you know, testify a lot for plaintiffs as well. So this doctor kind of, you know, I've heard his name before, even heard his name back in 1999 when I was first started. So he's been around the block. Anyway, the two witnesses who did testify that the client had CRPS were his physiatrist, right, whose evaluation was not consistent with his opinion. I don't know what that means, but I guess like his medical or clinical evaluation and the actual diagnosis of CRPS was not consistent with his opinion that the client has CRPS. Maybe the evaluation showed he doesn't have CRPS because there's like four criteria for CRPS. Maybe he didn't meet any of the criteria. So then how can you just say that he's got it? You know, it doesn't make sense. There's a Budapest criteria. There's certain things you have to show. Like when we proved our case, we we had some of the criteria. We didn't have all four, but we had, I think, two of the four. And then we also had like uh, uh, like an EMG type test, like a sympathetic skin response test. So it's like objective evidence because you can't fake that test. And we had like a renowned expert neurophysiologist who specialized in CRPS, not just a physiatrist. And the other doctor said he just inserted it in an undated addendum because he had a conversation with an unidentified person. And he's, uh, so that's not good at all. So yeah, that got, that got kicked out. So that's an example of a, a case where you get a good verdict, like, you know, millions of dollars. And then it gets, I mean, it didn't get completely destroyed. He, he got some money. Uh, what was it? It was uh, 1 and 2 and 2.5. So it was 3, 4, 5. It was 5.5 million. Wow, 5.5 million. But it got reduced to like 450, 250. So it got reduced to like six, 700, right? It's 700 essentially. 710, I guess. Well, still not terrible, right? You got something less than a million, but 700,000, but you had 5 million. But they said, no, no. <laughs> not going to play that. Uh, get that get that out of here because that's there's no evidence you have to have evidence okay i hope this was helpful let us know what questions you have we are here for you our goal is helping serious injury victims and families okay all the best bye-bye